All right, I, I, I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to tell you why I picked up Luke chapter 1 as, as, the, as the story that I want to uh, talk about this morning. Um, the story of the birth of a guy called John the Baptist. By the way, I'm going to come back to John the Baptist in the series, um, God of the Underdogs. Uh, but before, uh, since I'm not talking much about John the Baptist, I still thought I'll pick up this passage and talk to you. It's a little, little longer passage, but it's a story. Just follow along with me as I read this story. Chapter 1 of Luke, um, verses 5. When Herod was the king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commands and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they both were very old. One day, Zechariah was serving in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by the Lord to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burnt, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. And you are to name him John. He will have great, you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will, fi he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent, unable to speak, until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service is in, the temple, uh, in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became a pregnant and went into a seclusion for five months. How kind! The Lord is, she exclaimed, he has taken away my disgrace for having no children. The story is uh, very self-explanatory, but I want to make few thoughts, bring a few thoughts out of this uh, just this morning. The last Sunday of Tabernacle, and as we look forward to the next phase uh, of Capstone from next Sunday. So a few weeks ago, well, actually a couple of months ago, um, we were looking at different places, and, um, and we were talking a lot of things about what's happening in the church, and the change in the leadership, and how both the churches have to come together, uh, and, and, and merge, and you know, all those things, the roads that, that, are, uh, you know, that, that our church has now uh, was in, and um, in the midst of all that, me and Janet were talking, and Janet looked at me and said, uh, so w what do you think, should, should we continue to pray for Dream Center? That was an interesting question for me. Uh, in, all the, in all the changes, all the decisions we're taking, she just asked me, do you think we should continue to pray for Dream Center? Should I ask my children to continue to pray for the Dream Center? Um, of course, I didn't answer that question. I, I, I kept quiet and I, I laid down, I, I closed my eyes, and I began to think, should we really continue to pray about Dream Center? Um, because two years ago, God gave the vision of Dream Center to us. 
to me and challenged me to believe in that and follow that. And I postponed it for a year because I wanted to make sure this is not something that I'm dreaming of. This is not something that came out of my thoughts. And I kept pushing it down, pushing it down. Um, and it kept coming back, kept coming back. The idea of a dream center, the idea of something uh, that would become a, a tool in our hands in order to reach out to people who do not know the gospel. I, I know I have no idea how to do that. Uh, because, of course, God didn't tell me how to do this. He just told me, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to move forward. So it took a year for me to come to a belief that, yeah, this is what God wants us to do as a church. And so it took a, it, it, and then it, it, I had to gather a lot of courage to stand up in front of you as, a, uh, as, as the church, as your leader, uh, as your pastor, and ask you, hey, you know what, this is where we are going. This is, this is the dream that God placed in my heart. Uh, and I think this is our dream. This is the next thing about Capstone. And let's, let's move forward to that. And um, as the months go by, went by, I've realized that most of you still did not join in the vision. And, and um, some of you believed in this vision and began to invest into that. Um, um, so I, I was... I was getting nervous. I was thinking, how come the church, entire church is not on my side? Uh, do they, do they don't believe in my leadership. They don't believe in this dream. Uh, uh, you know, all those questions. By the end of this year, uh, in 2018, um, um, the, the, you know, the financial support is less because I believe um, if you believe in your leader, you will put your money in, in, into your leader. That's basically the leadership principle. Any, ask any leader, that's what they'll tell you. And if people are not backing you up, it simply means this vision is not right. It simply means this is not what God wants you to do. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was sitting there and I'm thinking, God, is this what it is? Uh, um, did I make a fool of myself in front of my church that I said, hey, this is the dream. Let's go there. And there are people who are believing and there are people who don't believe it. There are people who are believing in, uh, in this dream and are investing into this. Some of them have actually saved up some money uh, for themselves but yet they broke that, uh, that, that deposits and, and pushed into this because they believed in this. And uh, would they feel like fools uh, when I tell them, hey, you know, we are not doing the Dream Center. We are going to the Lemon Tree. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, sorry, I, I'm being very candid today and I think I should be. So I'm there I am at a, at a, very, at a big crossroads this, this the early part of January. And... Um, and then um, suddenly so many things took place in our church. Just, in, you know, it's as if um, uh, uh, I was expressing this last Sunday to, to evening service people. It, it's almost as if somebody took a sledgehammer and kept hitting on my head one after the other. Blow, hurt, hurt. And the, and the more they are coming and my wife is asking me this question. Do you really think we should pray? Man, that's it. I don't know uh, uh, you, if you have ever been in that place. The place where I am, uh, I was at least, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. That you believed something and you moved forward for it. You invested everything that you got into that. And then you suddenly find yourself at a place where it almost looks as if God abandoned you and walked away from you and you are like, uh, I thought you told me to do this. I thought you asked me to take this step, and I took this step, and where are you, God? What's happening to my player? What's happening to my dream? So I asked the question to God. Say, what's happening, God? I mean, should we pray? Should we not pray? Should we believe this? Should we not believe this? Um, was my prayer, and then, um, of course, you know, God always speaks to us through his word. And um, my heart went to uh, this, this passage in, in, in Luke chapter 1. And, and I began to read through that and um, read through the situation of Zechariah. And then it slowly dawned on to me on how God works. How God works in his own, in his own style in his own way, uh, with everything that he's got on this world. Here is something I've realized. Um, that uh, ultimately, God has to do his purpose on the earth. 
God will do only what brings glory to Him. God will do what would be the benefic- most beneficial to the world and to us. Only that. He will not do more than anything else other than that. There are only two ways God answers. Two, for two reasons God answers. I'll come to that. A little more explanation I'll give you towards the end of the sermon. But there are two reasons why God answers. One, so that He could be glorified through all this. Number two, so that you could be better and people who are around you could be blessed because of you. Those are the only two reasons why God answers. And that's what I've realized. Okay, so till I come to a position where I am a better tool, till Capstone comes to a position where Capstone, Liam's, everyone in Capstone, becomes a tool in the hand of God, a better tool in the hand of God to bring healing to this world, God will keep pushing it, keep pushing it. But that does this mean we should not move forward to that? That's the question. That was the question I had to ask God. And um, God began to speak to me about how anything that God did on the earth and in the, in, in through the scriptures all began with man taking the first step. God speaking to the man but before God did anything, man believing in and stepping forward. And so I wrote down what I felt was God speaking to me, um, you know, in, in this process. Um, last night as we watched, um, I wasn't sure what I need to speak this morning. I just wanted to speak about giving thanks to God for all the things that he has done. Maybe I'll, come, I'll, I'll speak about that this evening. Uh, but last night after we watched the movie and... Uh, some of us were, you know, Pastor Nani and some of us, we, we were hanging around at a food court and we're eating together and then, uh, you know, just got into a conversation about what would have gone through Graham Stein's mind as he's being burnt alive. It's not about him being burnt alive. It's about the two kids that are beside him, right? Um, it's your children. It's like you got dreams for them. you got plans for them. It's okay you die. It's not okay they die, you know. It's, it's okay something happens to you. It's not okay something happens to them. The reason you follow God is because you hope that because of your sacrifice, your children are safe. That your children have a better future. But then here is a man who sacrificed his entire 35 years of life and, 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 and gave his best to this country, to these people, uh, um, and, and uh, with, with no expectation back uh, from, uh, from them, but with, with only this, this confidence that Scripture tells us that if I serve you well, then in heaven I have a reward. I'm sure Graham Steins had that in his mind. I'm okay if I don't get a reward here. I'm okay if nothing happens to me. I'm okay if nobody recognizes me. I'm going to go there and get my reward. I'm sure that would have been his his driving force. I'm sure when he faced disappointments, when, when people walked up to him and, and ridiculed him for the work that he's doing, when people looked at him as an outcast uh, because he was working with outcasts and lepers, when uh, people uh, uh, persecuted him because they thought he's forcefully converting people into, uh, into Christianity, um, all these things were happening, uh, disappointments were happening. He would have told himself, because I would, if, I would have, if I was there, I would have told myself the same thing. Uh, he would have told himself, it's okay. It's okay to fail here. It's more important that I win there. That's more important. Let me just keep my eyes. That's what he would have told his wife. That's what he would have told his daughter. Maybe not his children, the young boys, but his daughter was growing up, right? So he would have told her, hey, let's, let's keep our eyes there. And now um, his, his faith is tested in the van as he sat there, uh, um, a light down, along with his children, uh, and as, as, as this van being burnt, um, what would have gone through his mind as he's getting burnt, begging them, just leave my children out, let me, you know, when we first heard of the news, we just saw the pictures, but then when we were watching movie, then that's when I realized, this is, a, this is a horrific, this is horrific, if I was there, man, I, I would have lost my faith instantly. I would have questioned everything that I did for God. Begging them, just leave the kids alone, man. 
But then asking God in his mind, God, are you going to come through right now? Maybe, I don't know, maybe if I was there, I would have asked that question. Maybe Graham Steins had more faith. Maybe he was believing that like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, uh, when they were in the, in the fiery furnace, God would somehow walk in and do a miracle. And hoping that, okay, God, it's okay, my, you know, we are being burnt alive. We have 50, 50 people with their clubs in their hands, with, with um, you know, uh, 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 trying to kill us. But I do know you're going to come now. I don't know what he believed in. Whether that or this, I don't know what was going through his mind. But at that point of time, I'm definitely sure he would have said, God, I wish you had spared my kids. I wish you hadn't disappointed me with this. Those moments we'll all have in our lives. I have a feeling that Zechariah had that moment for quite some time. I prayed, I begged you God that you would give a child to me. We hoped that because we serve you so faithfully, because we serve you uh, tirelessly, we hoped that you would answer it at the right time. But it's almost as if God just took off his hands and just sat, stood there aside silently, watching we fail in his name. I mean, it's not even for us. We did that. We did it for him. We believed that that's what God wants us to do, wanted us to do. And then we are the ones who are failing here. We are the ones people are laughing about. We are the ones people are going to talk behind us. So that's when you ask this question. Are you really going to answer my prayers? I mean, what is, the, what is that that you want from me, God? From the incident of Zechariah, I don't know where you are today. I don't know if that is the question that you're asking God. But here are four things that I've learned from this entire incident about how God answers our prayers. And I think we, are, we have to learn this. We have to imprint them upon our hearts because that's how God answers his prayers, our prayers to him. Number one. God answers his pray our prayers in his own time. You must remember that God answers our prayers in his time, not our time. Not when we think he should answer us. Not when we think he should now speak to me. No. He would answer our prayers in his time. That means according to his schedule, according to his timetable. You see, you are not the only person, me, I am I'm not the only person in this world that is praying to God. You see, you and me are not the only church that is begging God to do a miracle for us. Every single day, across the world, across, uh, across the continents and across the countries, in villages, deep inside jungles, there are people who are praying for God to do something for their church, just like us. So in order to make sure that whatever he does in this world will bring glory to his name, at the same time will also be healthy for the church, for you and for me, God has to wait for the right time. His time. Not when I think it should happen, not when you think it should happen, but when he knows it should happen. In your life, it's the same. For your dream, it's the same. You may be asking God, shedding tears, begging God, fighting with God. You better answer now. And it's all, it's, God is like absolutely silent. And he's saying, maybe through his silence he's saying, now nah, you've got to wait. i got my own time. Now Zechariah is an amazing guy. He was an amazing guy. You, you saw that Bible testifies that he was a righteous man. He and his wife, not just him, but both of them are righteous people. And when he was inside this sanctuary uh, serving God, especially in the, you know, you know that the, the, the Old Testament tabernacle had 
three parts, right? The, the, the outer court, the, you know, the, 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 the most holy place, and then the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was laid. Only one person, once in a year, could get inside and serve God inside that sanctuary. And it was Zechariah's turn that year. So he walked inside and he's, he's, he's offering the sacrifices and praying to God um, um, as he's offering incense. And as he stood there, the angel of the Lord stood there and began to speak to him. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and answer, you know, tell him something that he was not expecting. I, I, I want you to know, the fact is this, that God often delays answers to our prayers. He doesn't answer everything immediately. Why? Why does he withhold a, a gift sometimes over a period of time? I have hard time, you know, sometimes we have hard time believing that God is going to answer our prayers. But if I, if I have an angel standing beside me and, and, and he's saying, Chaitanya, you know, I'm here to tell you that God is going to answer, God has answered your prayers. Uh, you know, you would think, and I would think, I'd be convinced if an angel is standing and is telling me. But look at Zechariah's reaction. Look at what he's saying to the angel. How can I be sure of this? That's how we are. In our prayers. Why didn't he believe it? Because he stopped praying that prayer. I think that's the reason. He couldn't believe it. He believes God is a great God. He believes that God can do miracles. But he just stopped praying for a miracle in his own life. And because of that, he couldn't believe an angel stood beside him and told him, God answered your prayer. Could it be possible that you prayed and prayed for one week, two weeks, one month, two, one, two months, one year, two years, or maybe five years, and then you said, nah, that's not going to happen. You just stopped. Because you thought, it's, it's not going to happen. You see, at that point of time, even if the angel stands beside you and tells you that God answered your prayer, you will still ask the same question. How can I be sure? It's a, it's a, it's a, I'm an old man. My wife is well into years. Uh, he's basically saying, I gave up man. That's what he's saying. It's a diplomatic way to answer, right? Uh, I'm an old guy. My wife is well into years. Obviously, he can't say my wife is old. He will not have food that night. So he has to say my wife is well into years. When the, when the angel told him, Zechariah, don't be afraid, uh, your prayer has been heard, the word literally means, the word heard literally means already happened. God already heard your prayer. Long back. The first time you both stood together or knelt down you know, uh, together beside your bed and began to ask God, God, we want to have a child. God heard it then. Not now. Then. It's yes, God delayed giving an answer to that, that prayer. But here is what we need to learn. It's the hardest thing that we need to learn, that God answers only in His time. Kids have a hard time learning that, isn't it? If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. They don't know the difference between no and not yet. It's hard for them. They'll say, I want, a, I, I want a chocolate now. 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 Now means now. And they will fight for it. I, I have a feeling that's how we are with God. But when we grow up, and if you're hungry and you're saying, I want a chocolate, or I want to eat something, and somebody beside you says, just wait for some more time, you will wait. Why? You're mature now. You understand that some things take time. That's the mark of a mature person who waits for an answer from God. I tried prayer. I prayed for two weeks. Nothing happened, so I give up on prayer. 
I lost my faith. Faith in prayer. No, you haven't lost your faith. You just lost um, your patience for God to answer. I already told you that there are two reasons why God delays prayer. One, God delays prayer because he wants us to be ready for us to receive his blessing. And two, he wants us to be ready that when we receive that blessing, we'll be willing to share it with somebody else. Till then, he's not going to give us. See, the fact is, God is never late. His timing is perfect. We may think he's late, but he's never. He never is late. God's delays are definitely not God's denial. Not yet does not mean no from God. So how long should I pray? That would be your question. Let me just answer that, and then I'll give you the second reason, or second thing that you need to remember when you pray. How long should I pray? Pray until three things happen. Number one, any one of these three things. Number one, until you get an answer. Oh, that's an obvious answer, right? Until you get an answer. Number two, until you get an assurance that God speaks to you through the word of God, through your daily meditation, or through using other people uh, uh, you know, in your life who, who are investing into your life, your mentors, and speak, to, speak through them, saying this, don't worry, I'm going to do this for you. If God gives you that assurance, stop praying about it. And that's why I stopped. I stopped worrying about it. I know this is not my dream. Dream Center is not my dream. Given a choice, I'd walk away from it. Given a choice, I'd walk away from Capstone. This is not my dream. This is God's dream. And I know if God wants to do something, He will do it. If God told me that He's going to do it, He's going to do it. Not, maybe not this year. Maybe next year. Maybe five years from now. Maybe 20 years from now. But He's going to do it. That's the confidence I have. He will. He has already given me that assurance. Uh, or number three, the third thing is this, that when you, you keep praying until God tells you that stop praying. I'm not going to do that. He will tell you if, he's not, if it is not his will. He will tell you. He will cause a peacelessness in your heart. He, he, you know, you, 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 will not, you will not be at peace at all uh, with regards to what you're praying for. You become uncomfortable about praying, uh, about praying for it. Um, he will reveal his will to you. You will figure that out in your journey. So keep praying till you get an answer or till you get an assurance, till you get a denial. One of those three. So uh, what's, the, what's the attitude that I need to have? I must be willing to accept that God will do whatever he, God will answer in his own time. Number two, I must be willing to let God answer in his own way. Let God answer in his own way. Not only whenever God thinks is the best, but however God thinks is the best for us. That we need to understand, we need to believe. God's ways are always better than and usually bigger than our dreams. Bigger than our ways. That's why all through the scripture, God kept saying that my ways are not your ways. My style is not your style. The way I answer things is not according to your plan, your, your, your ideas. I've got my own mind about everything in this world, about, every, about your life, your family, about your children. My ways are definitely higher than your ways, God says. So sometimes God delays our prayers because what we thought was really big could be small to God. Could be really small to God. What we assumed, ah, oh, this is a really big task. God could be saying, nah, that's really too small for me to do. It could be possible that God is saying, I'm delaying it because I want to do much bigger. Much better. Better than you dreamt. Better than you thought it would be. I want to do that, that way. We got to understand that fact. 
The reason I'm delaying it is because I want to do it in a much better way. Imagine the day that Elizabeth and Zechariah prayed and asked for a baby. What if God answered the, uh, the, their prayer immediately? What if they had a child immediately? A little Jewish boy. They would have loved him or her. They would have cherished the little boy. Uh, the boy would have grown up to be a great guy because obviously the parents are great. But he delayed answering Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer because God was preparing Zechariah and Elizabeth to give birth to one of the greatest Old Testament prophets and to send him into this world at the right time. Exactly when Jesus shows up on the earth. It could be possible that God is delaying our prayers, your prayer, my prayer, because God is saying, hey, I've got a John the Baptist preparing for you. So it's okay. That's why God delayed Hannah's prayer. Because God had to answer Hannah's prayer at a time when the whole country needs a guy called Samuel. Samuel comes only when God knows this is the time Samuel is needed for this country, for these people. That's why he's, you know, a greatest Old Testament judge that you can see. You see, our problem is twofold. We ask too little and we want it too quick. That's our problem. Instead of uh, letting God work in his time, in his way, to do something bigger, we don't dream big enough. We don't pray big enough. We don't think big enough. We aim too low. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, but God is able to do even exceedingly above what you can are able to ask, think, or imagine. You need to believe this verse, and I think I need to believe this verse. As a church, we need to believe this verse, that yes, I'm going to believe God for something impossible. <laughs> I've realized this. I, I can think of the biggest thing that I can pray for, and pray, and I can actually hear God smiling and saying, Really? That's all you can think about? But actually, I, I want to thank God for all the things that we go through. Let me just phrase that and then I'll, I'll go to the... I've got only 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll just move forward to the next point. You know, when we prayed, right in the beginning, when I prayed for this church, and I, I, you know, I had a business deal with God, I said, God... If you give me a 30,000 member church, then I will go ahead and plant this church, Capstone. Um, and actually, I believe that God did want to give us that kind of church. I still believe, by the way. But it's bigger than that. But let me just pause there and I just want to tell you this. But this is what God taught me because there were times when I fought with God, saying, God, why don't we grow faster than other churches. I mean, I mean, we are really good, right? We've got a great worship team. We've got a great setup. Um, I think I'm okay as a preacher, but I, you know, we, we should get people, you know? Why, why are people not coming? And uh, this is what God taught me. Uh, over the years, this is what God taught me. You really don't want them. You really don't want them. You want little by little. Little by little, little by little. You don't want all of them at one go because you will not know how to handle them. Trust me, really. I'm standing here today and telling you this. I can't handle three churches. I'm glad we got into two now. I'm happy. I'm happy that I get to pass to more people now with two campuses. I've learned that. It's a good learning. Sometimes he breaks your back and tells you, it's okay, people laugh at you, but it's good. For you, you will become a better person. You'll become a better leader. Next time, another leader will follow you. He will learn from your mistakes. So I'm glad. 
I'm glad I, I, I've lost some things. I'm glad people broke my heart. I'm glad that I made bad decisions. Not that I will continue to make, but I'm glad I made some bad decisions. Because now I learn growing happens slowly. So it's okay if God is delaying your, 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 your prayer. And, um, you know, I, if God gives you really all that you request, you, you know, <laughs> you will destroy your life. You remember uh, old, uh, old saying about uh, John D. Rockefeller, um, about his generosity, and somebody asked him this question, um, you know, you got so many billions and you know that he was one of the richest people who ever lived on the earth. Uh, you got so much. Um, you know, how about giving somebody a one million dollars? He'd say, nah, I'd never give anybody a million bucks. Because it would ruin him. They can't handle it. If somebody who's poor and he gets one million dollars at one go, he just doesn't know what to do with that. And I think that's a principle God follows with us. I can't give everything in one go because you don't know how to handle it. You're not ready for it. Your hands are not strong enough for it. Take time to get strong before you get what you were asking for, what I promised you. You see, Leonard Ravenhill, one of the greatest preachers um, that Christendom has ever seen, says this, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to God. Wait a second, think about that. So it's almost like walking into a, um, into, a, into a chocolate shop and you pick up a chocolate that you think is the best and then you say, I want that. You get what you think is the best. But what if you walked up to the shopkeeper and said, I want the best out of all this. Whatever shopkeeper picks would be the best chocolate in, in the house. Number three, the third thing that you, need, you and I need to remember is this, that you must be willing to let God answer uh, our prayers in His power. In His power. We are... The problem with us is we try to help God to get his job done on the earth. We think God cannot function without our help. I mean, God does want to use us. Remember that. He will only do his will on the earth using us. That is for sure. Remember that. But he knows how to do his job. Let's not get confused with that. In his power, in his style, he will do it. I think God often lets our situation get worse before he makes it better. Until a point where we become hopeless and almost gave up on everything and then God shows up, answers his prayer. Because that's how you know God did this. Any other way, you're going to logically reason it out, I worked hard. You're going to tell I'm the boss. I think God tries to remind us by delaying our prayers sometimes because he's trying to say, nah, I'm the boss. You got to wait for me to do things in my power. With my power. So both Elizabeth and Zechariah or Abraham and Sarah gave exactly the same excuse, right? They said, this is not possible, humanly impossible. God said, yeah, that's why I waited this long. It has to become humanly impossible before God intervenes and does something through that. Only then, you see, the problem with us is we are not grateful to God. Remember that. We are not grateful people. We, are, we always find something that God did not do. It's just naturally, with our, you know, ingrained in our, in, in our just life, our nature. We are like that. If God answers our prayers, we'll always find something fault with that. We'll always find, find something to say, you didn't do this. If, I had given a, if, if there was a choice given to me, I would have done it this way. So I guess God waits. 
till you know you exhaust all your resources you exhaust all your plans you exhaust all that you got and then say finally god really you better show up and then that's when i guess you will become more grateful to him so don't be surprised this is a warning to you that if you start praying about something particularly a problem in your life do not be surprised if it's getting worse before it starts getting better number 4 the fourth thing that you and i need to remember is this that you and i must be willing to let god answer for his purpose for his own purpose not only whenever he wants however he wants but also for whatever reason he wants to answer our questions our prayers i told you if you look at the entire bible and look at all the prayers that have been offered to god look at all the answered prayers you will only three, you will only see two reasons why god always answered those prayers number one that we grow number two that he gets glory we grow he gets glory we grow he gets glory that's what you need to remember god will answer our prayers only when we are growing and ultimately he is the one who is getting the glory if that's not going to happen he'll wait till that time comes why did god answer elizabeth and zechariah's prayer after so many years that's the reason the angel gave him hey john the baptist is not for you john the baptist got a got a purpose your child has a purpose that's why god is giving you the child be glad that he's giving you the child and he's going to use your child to do something great not for you but for the world ha ah, that's when it dawned down to my head so he can only do the dream center he will only do the dream center when he knows we as a church are ready to say it's not us it's not ours we will invest into it we will build it but it's not ours unless we as capstone learn that he will not do that it's very simple till we come to a point uh, yes we are going to give everything that we got to get this done but we and we know this is not for us we know this is for somebody else i think my mind has not it been there is did not reach there that's why it's getting delayed or if i if i am not convinced about if i'm not trained to think like that you will not be trained to think like that and that's what god taught me you are not you are not there yet so wait till you get there and then you will begin to see how i can answer let me close with this thought that's very important for us to remember in acts chapter uh, sorry romans chapter 1 paul writing this letter to the church in rome and he's saying this <clears throat> he expresses his desire his one single desire one single prayer uh, uh, you know for himself all his prayers uh, have been about this one single moment in verse 7 he says to all who are in rome who are called by god uh, and to the saints he's writing that letter to them he's been praying for them and then verse 10 he says in my prayers at all times i pray now that at last by god's will the way may be opened for me to come to you This is Paul writing to the Roman church and he's saying I know I have not been there I did not come to your church but I've been praying for you for quite some time this has been my dream my dream is that I'll come to you that God would open a door for me to come to you in verses 15 he says that's why I I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome look at his heart he's expressing himself he's saying I've been praying for you I've been dreaming about you I've been dreaming that this is what God would do one day God would open a door for me to go to Rome and I want to be with you guys I want to preach to you I want to encourage you I've been praying about this I've done so much for God this was my dream this is my dream this is where I'm moving forward in chapter 15 of the same book verses 20 
And look at his, 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 his passion. You will see his passion for his dream. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not known, uh, uh, Christ was not known so that I would not be building someone else on building, some, uh, building on someone else's foundation. And then by the time you come to that ending of that chapter, he's saying, I have a plan to go to Spain, but before I go to Spain or after I go to Spain, I'll come to you, church, church in Rome. I'm going to be with you guys. You see the build-up in that book? In verse chapter 1, he's saying, I've been praying for you. I've been dreaming about you. This is my one desire that I come to you. By the time you come to chapter 15, he's, he built up his faith so much that he already began to plan that he would travel to Spain and come to them. But then, the first ever time, Paul enters to Rome. Finally, he manages to reach to Rome, using all his uh, head and you know, ideas and God's favor and all that stuff, going through a really rough time when he traveled to Rome. He was shipwrecked, caught in, a, caught in an island full of snakes, was bitten by snakes, most poisonous snakes that were ever found, and still survived all that, and somehow managed to reach Rome. The first thing that happens to Paul is that he would be caught and put in a prison. Never got a chance to preach the gospel in Rome. Before he could even utter the name of Jesus in the streets of Rome or even in the Roman church, he was beheaded. What happened to his dream? What happened to his prayers? I mean, he's been wishing and praying and asking God to do that and just, just vanishes. But then something else unfolded during that time while he was in the prison. He was, I think he was there for two years. While he was there in those two years, because he didn't have anything to do in his hands, the one thing that he began to do is to write letters to the churches that he planted and encourage them with the word of God. And those letters became what we call today the New Testament. What if God granted him his wish? We wouldn't have had a New Testament in our hands. But because what seemed like a denial of a dream, we have a New Testament in our hands. But last 2,000 years, every single church that has ever been planted after that were encouraged, were taught what to believe in, how to believe in it, what to follow, what not to follow. Because there was, well, there was one man whose dream got shattered, but in whose life God's purpose was fulfilled. So if you feel like Paul in Roman prison, it's okay. Chances are you could be writing the New Testament. You may not know that right now, but when you go to heaven, you will know that. I don't know what Graham Steins thought. And I'm sure, even though God did not save Graham Staines or his two children, I'm absolutely sure God whispered into his ears, hey, it's going to change India. It's going to challenge a lot of young people to become missionaries like you. People may call it injustice at this point of time, a thousand years from now, when Christ returns, people will be glad that something like that had happened. Because of a Graham Stein and two, his, two of his children, what if this entire country gets saved? That could be the purpose of God. 